we continue our conference uh, with a speaker, I'm very happy that we can present him to you. So we worked all the years to get someone from Spotify on stage, but that was not so easy. Um, and so we are really happy to have uh, Robert here on stage from Spotify. So welcome, Robert Stevenson, Senior Product Manager from Spotify. Applause, please. And I think uh, most of you will use Spotify on your mobile phones and uh, you know that service. So Robert and I, we did also an interview on digitaleleute.de um, where we discussed uh, most of his transition from uh, engineer uh, to the product manager role. He was um, engineer at LinkedIn um, at the beginning of his career. Now he's a product manager at Spotify. And today he will a little bit explain in detail how they do their data collection platform. and. Uh, that you get an idea how big this uh, platform is. So yesterday he told me that there are 10 million tracking events per second at Spotify. Um, so someone has to handle that and his teams uh, builds the platform for that. So Robert, thank you very much for being with us. Yes, thank the stage you. is yours. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Stefan. Uh, before we get started, I'd be interested in just knowing who we have in the audience today. Any product managers, product people? Okay, yeah, a lot of you, great. What about engineering? Okay, any, any data people, data science, data engineering? All right, last one, any just general tech leadership, maybe you don't fit into any of these buckets, but we span them all, <laughs> a lot of them. Okay, awesome. Really excited to be here and to see a bit of a mixed bag in the audience uh, and excited to be here in person as well. Uh, my name is Robert Stevenson and I am a senior platform product manager at Spotify. Oh, there you go. I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. I went to the University of Waterloo where I got a degree in computer science. After graduating, I moved to Silicon Valley where I worked as a distributed systems engineer uh, working on the social graph database there. And then I had always been interested in living and working in Europe. I found this really exciting opportunity at Spotify. So in 2016, five years ago, I moved overseas and I've been here ever since. And today, I'm going to talk to you about a particular niche of product management called platform product management. So a platform product is some kind of product or solution which is horizontally supporting your company or parts of your company in one way or another. And when a company has a need for this kind of product, very often they're going to be evaluating a build versus buy decision. And you might choose to buy a license to some off-the-shelf B2B product, but if you choose to build it in-house, then the team and the PM who are responsible for making sure that that need is met would be a platform product team and platform product management. Examples of this kind of product is if you maybe have an in-house built A-B testing platform, which you use to run experiments and try to understand what uh, is providing value to your users, or maybe you have some shared infrastructure that you use to deploy new versions of your app out to your users dozens of times per day. Um, and one of the interesting features of this kind of platform is that quite often they can be very technical. These two examples are very technical. And that's what really drew me into this particular niche of product management because I find it spans both product and engineering quite well. Now, my problem space is data. The platform that I'm responsible for is Spotify's data collection platform. And today, I'll be taking you through the journey that Spotify has gone, with, gone through with data over the past 15 years and how we strive to try to make data collection at Spotify a solved problem. And spoiler, it's not solved. I assume that most of you are familiar with Spotify. If you're not, we're a music and podcast streaming service with 380 million monthly active users there around. And today, Spotify is a pretty complex product. It operates with a complicated business model. And with that, it brings a vast variety of different data needs that we have. But at the beginning of time, Spotify was not a complex product. We didn't have a complex business just yet. What we had was a magic trick. And that was the ability to make you feel like you had all the world's music in your pocket without having to illegally download gigabytes of music from Napster and upload them onto an iPod. Behind this magic trick was really fast Swedish internet connections and peer-to-peer -peer networking. But we put a nice user experience on top of it and we disrupted the music industry. But the other thing which we had, which was pretty groundbreaking at the time, was the Spotify engineering culture. 
And this got made quite famous by, uh, with a couple of videos by a, a former Agile coach of ours named Henrik Knieberje. If you get access to the slides, there's links to these things at the end. But the thing that I'll pick out from the, this, this famous Spotify engineering culture is the concept of autonomous squads. We operate with kind of the, the mantra that we, we want to have these loosely coupled, tightly aligned squads or teams, and that having them aligned will enable that autonomy. A squad is really the unit of, our, of execution in R&D at Spotify. It will be composed of a product manager, an agile coach, and between five and seven engineers. And this is at least how it's written about. It's not exactly the same today. Then within this squad, they'll be responsible for autonomously having impact and navigating a particular prob problem space. The squads will all have their own missions. And the way that we organize the squads will be such that these missions line up so when they're all autonomously having impact within those problem spaces, it ends up doing what's right for Spotify globally. That's the idea. So back to data. What do we need out of data collection and data in the early days of Spotify as a company? Well, firstly, we do have some pretty strict data needs. We need to track company key metrics. We need to understand how many users we have and how engaged they are. And the way that we do this is by, by tracking quite carefully the playback data, so what people are listening to. Uh, and the squad responsible for playback, you heard from Nezreen this morning, now it's a tribe, but back in the day it was a squad. They would add the instrumentation, so the signal capture, so we would understand who is listening to what. And then we can use this data to understand our MAU and other metrics. The other goal that the platform has in this early stage is to be able to ena enable whatever the data needs are of these autonomous squads. And in general, it's good engineering practice to have instrumentation and observability built into your features. You want to understand what usage looks like. You want to understand what you need to optimize. Uh, maybe be, have that in instrumentation in there so you can debug. And we wanted to be able to make it so these squads could focus on providing business value on top of our platform without having to solve the complicated data engineering and distributed systems problems that are associated with collecting data. So this is more or less what the first version of the event delivery platform looked like. Uh, and because I wasn't there, this is a, a, a reenactment maybe. But the clients would call, would, would make a log call, which would then be received by the, the access point backends. These access points would log that data to disk using syslog where we would have scheduled cron tab jobs SCPing the data from the access points to our Hadoop cluster, and a job would then filter out the data events from the crap, uh, split the events based on what event type they were, and remove duplicates. Then the data would be available in Hadoop for further data processing and Hive queries and things like this. And the goal of this early platform was, to, like I said, to abstract away what's technically challenging about doing this sort of thing. And that meant that it wasn't exactly a platform per se, it was more of a solution that worked, and then somebody generalized it for the greater good, and as usage grew, we factored it out to become its own platform. Now, fast forward to 2016, which is when I joined, and we're still totally agnostic to the data that's being collected. We think of ourselves as the transport layer, and our job is to get data from really point A to point B. But the technical problems that we're trying to support have changed. It's no longer about uh, exactly once delivery and schema management and maintaining a Hadoop cluster. That we, we figured out how to do that. Now it's about handling the rapid scale increase that Spotify has. In 2016, I think we had just crossed 100 million MAU and we were increasing very rapidly. So that was one of the big problems that we had. Or, I mean, it's a very nice problem to have, of course. Uh, the other business goal that we had was to migrate our tech stack to the cloud. Today, we're totally a GCP shop, but back in the day, we were, everything was on-premise, and we had decided that we were going to be able to get more value by having Google take care of those challenging distributed systems problems for us so we could provide business value on top. Sounds familiar. So we had the goal of handling scale, doing it in the cloud, but we had another, when I look back, it's kind of a funny situation, but it wasn't so funny back then, which was an imminent, the imminent threat of what we call doomsday. And because we were operating an in-house Hadoop cluster, it was already the biggest Hadoop cluster in Europe, and you can only fit so many servers into one data center. 
So we were actually at the point that we could not get any more machines into that data center, so it was going to overflow with data, essentially. The squad that sat next to me when I joined had a doomsday clock that got as low as 60 days. So really, we needed to do this, make, make whatever changes we needed to do fast. Oh uh, uh, yeah, so this is explaining the scale increase. So the goal was to build a new version of the event delivery platform, do it in the cloud, and make scalability really the priority. And we had to do it fast. Uh, so we were able to take advantage of all the nice elasticity properties that you get from the cloud. We can auto-scale up and down with the traffic. And we did successfully solve it. We did it in time. We avoided doomsday. And we did it the w one of the ways that we did it fast was by keeping that access point as the interface the same. So it was a backwards compatible change, actually. We didn't need to do a large-scale company migration. And as we prepared for incoming scale, the scale did indeed explode. We went from, in 2016, a million and a half messages per second to three years later, quintupling that to just over eight. Now it's around 10. We've had some optimization since then. But we were very glad to have the elasticity of the cloud there. And some lessons that I've internalized from this stage. Firstly, the problem space for platform products is a moving target, uh, and it changes as the organization scales. Early on, it might be about abstracting away the difficult problems, the difficult technical problems, so that way the teams that need to use the platform can focus on providing value on top of it. And that brings me to the next step. So we had this massive scale increase, which was not just users, it was also in terms of the data we were collecting. But the value we were getting out of that data was not increasing at anywhere near the same pace. So we do some user research. We try to figure out what's going on. Why are we not getting the value out of data as we would expect? And we have two user segments here. We have, on the left-hand side, the feature producer, or the, the, the feature teams, which are, we consider the data producers. And these are the autonomous squads who are building the Spotify user experience and are adding instrumentation to the features to, for, for, for good reasons. And on the right-hand side are the consumers who need to read data out of the platform to try to derive some kind of value get some insights, maybe do personalization. And back in the day, it was very common that these two segments would be the same, because the autonomous squad which would add the instrumentation needed to use that for their own purposes. But as we scaled, we now have more and more dedicated data teams who need to use, use the data for totally different reasons, like, like I mentioned, personalization or reporting. So we're not able to get the value out of the data that we expect. So it's time to stop being just the transport layer and take a look in the back of the truck and figure out what it is people are actually sending. And we see they're sending freeform data. And this is really surprising to us because we have strongly typed events. We're not providing a schema-less data collection platform. But if you have schemas, that doesn't stop somebody from creating an event or a schema which has a field called JSON, and then they can just dump whatever crap in there they want. And while this is maybe the most egregious example of uh, freeform data that we observed, what was really biting us was these two events that we used to try to holistically understand the Spotify session. Those events are called UI impression and UI interaction. And when you navigate in the Spotify app and we show you, say, a, uh, an album, an album cover art, we would generate an impression event because it made an impression on your screen. If you interact with it, it generates the interaction event. And this is all good in theory, but because we were, there's still so many degrees of freedom in terms of how teams could use these events. So in some cases, uh, we want to generate an interaction when somebody has clicked on something. But is that going to be, gen is, that, is the action field in that event, is that going to be called a click, or is it going to be called a hit, or is it going to be called touch? There's too many degrees of freedom. And semantically, what that represents can vary as well. You can like things in Spotify. You can like an artist, you can like a track, you can like an album. But we realized when we looked at the data that in various places, a like was considered a heart or was considered add to collection. So imagine the poor data scientist trying to read from this holistic data set and then coalescing all these different things to try to figure out what it actually means. <clears throat> so we form a hypothesis for why we think this, happening. this is happening. And it brings us back to our good friend, Autonomy. 
And it's not to say that autonomy is not working for us. It is working really well to be able to deliver additional business value. We can still organize four or five squads together to autonomously work within their problem spaces and deliver on getting into podcasts, for example. But if you see the guy on the left-hand side, it says, how does Spotify do X? Well, if X is the technical solution that is supporting that business value, the answer is it depends on which squad. And that's the same for data. So we start to have massive fragmentation in the tech that is underlying what we're building. And that brings me to what is the next stage of platform product management as the company scales. And is using the platform to provide some kind of standardization in a scaling organization. But you're not making a choice between either having autonomy or standardization. It's a scale. And as you try to get more, enforce more and more standardization, you're reducing the degrees of freedom, but not necessarily eliminating them. And, on, and there's going to be pros and cons depending on what you try to do. On the far left-hand side with pure autonomy, you're not going to have any reuse. You're not going to be able to take advantage of the sweet solution that the team next to you solved. But on the bright side, you can make hyper-specialized solutions that maybe satisfy your use case really well. And you're not going to have dependencies. So this should cause you to move faster. On the far standardization end, you're, you won't have fragmentation, but you might create a bottleneck because the team which is responsible for those standards could become overloaded trying to adapt to them. And you might exclude some use cases in those standards, intentionally or otherwise. So I often get asked, how do you know if it's time to enforce standardization on a common technical problem? And that depends. It's very tricky. And it depends on the business use case that you're actually trying to solve by achieving standardization or reducing fragmentation. In our case, we had this business need. Because with these UI impression, UI interaction events, it was not easy or it was near impossible for us to truly understand holistically the Spotify session. We could optimize and we could personalize by using that music listening data that we made sure to rigidly collect, collect at the very beginning. But there's so much more you can do in Spotify than just listen to music, at least as far as we're concerned with what makes a recommendation good. Maybe we recommend to you an artist, and then you go browse their catalog and add a bunch of tracks to a playlist. That indicates a good recommendation. So we should be able to reflect that and train the models based on that information. So we're having trouble developing the feedback loop that's necessary for us to do good personalization. And this is the approach that we took in order to try to achieve this standardization. And underlying it all, it, there has to be a real business need and problem for you to try to do this because it is a very costly procedure to, to go under. So in the case where the standardization is causing the engineers to be a little bit annoyed, if that's not associated with the business problem, then maybe it's not worth it. Or maybe it is. But the first step is to really get the authority to actually solve the problem. You don't want to end up being in the situation where there's 10 ways to solve data collection. So you're going to come up with one solution to rule them all, and now you have 11. So if the, the users, the people who are already solving it in different ways, are not bought into the fact that you are going to provide them with the one solution to rule them all, it's going to be difficult. In our case, we formed a new team which was going to solve this particular problem around instrumenting the Spotify session. Now, the second step here is where you form opinions on how to do it. And I use the word opinions here on purpose because it's not going to be a clear right or wrong decision. If it was, you wouldn't have this fragmentation in the first place. But So it's going to be a trade-off. And these are also, while they're the very critical design decisions that go into a platform product, when the problem space is technical, these are going to be technical best practices and theory and really pr pr maybe properly uh, difficult technical problems. And I used the example of experimentation before. There's a lot of math and statistics that goes into doing experimentation well. So me, as a product manager who sort of tangentially understands experimentation, I'm definitely not the right person to try to standardize on what that methodology should be. But we do have a guy who's called a math engineer. I want him to help me work on it. So the big message in this part is invite the discussion, have lots of conversation between the various tech experts and the domain experts to try to figure out the right way to try to solve the problem. 
as product, I can try to make it pragmatic and apply product principles for how it's going to apply to the company in the current situation. In the case of data collection, this meant aligning on what the schemas and data models should look like, as well as what identifiers we were going to need to have in the event so we could join them together and connect the dots, so to speak, and understand the session. Once you've figured out how you think you should solve it, the next step is to actually build it into the platform. There's, of course, a lot of different ways that you could do this. Uh, what we chose to do is we wanted to not have you, the, the, for this particular use case, have users uh, interacting with the, plat the infrastructure directly. We instead wanted to build them a framework they could use, which would uh, abstract away the, the data model and these identifiers. So what they do now is, and there'll be a screenshot of this in a second, is they specify what the semantics of their feature are, so what the different buttons are supposed to do, and then through code generation, we take care of the rest. And then the last step is to migrate the company to actually use these new standards. And this is actually a really nuanced point. I could talk about it for an hour. Uh, I won't bore you with it. But the one thing that I'll point out about it is this can be an incredibly, incredibly costly operation migrating 100 teams, which we, have, we might have at Spotify. No matter how easy the migration is, getting 100 teams to do anything is extremely costly. And when you're analyzing if the cost benefit of doing the standardization is the right thing to do, you'll need to take into consideration, uh, you'll need to take into consideration the migration cost. Now, lessons that I've internalized from this standardization stage is that by making your platform opinionated, you can help bring alignment to a large, scaling, autonomous organization. But recognize that this is a trade-off. There's, uh, there's going to be increased friction that, uh, that is associated with using your product because, as a result of this, these standards which you're enforcing. So you need to ask yourself, does the business need for the standardization outweigh the cost of that friction? And then lastly, don't forget to include the cost of migrating to the new platform in your decision making, because this can be very costly. As a result, we did manage to solve the business problem. We can construct the feedback loop and personalize Spotify Home like I showed on the earlier page. On the left-hand side, a user will specify what the semantics of their feature are. And then on the right-hand side, we have a visualization of what the data looks like, where we're able to connect the dots and understand the Spotify user experience much, much better. And that brings us to more or less today. But before I get into what we're how we're thinking now, I'll do a little bit of a recap. We began with a pretty simple business, which came, came with it, a simple data collection platform. The goal was to abstract away what's technically difficult, so that way autonomous squads could focus on providing business value on top. Then as we start, hit our massive scale increase, those technical problems were now more around scalability and being able to use the elasticity available in the cloud and avoiding doomsday. But as we grew, we started to have very, uh, very real business problems associated with the, under the fragmentation of our underlying tech. This was not only applicable to data, it was also the case with for a lot of the other tech underlying these autonomous squads. And th that business need that we focused on was personalizing specific pages like home. We needed to understand if we gave you a recommendation, did that lead you to do more than just listen to music, like adding to a playlist? To solve this, we followed that four-step process, and the, the real solution there was to build an opinionated framework that would bake the data model that we had in mind for Spotify sessions into the data that was produced so it would be standardized and readable at the other side. But we're getting some curious feedback on that standardized session data. Everyone who's been at Spotify for more than a couple years think it's amazing and they're super excited that they can use it to understand so much more. But if they join more recently, they think it's terrible. It's curious. What we find is that we've given the data community a taste of what should be possible if you can understand the session and we solve the imminent business problems that we had but now they want to do more, and they see what should be possible, and they're having trouble being able to do it. So our team is becoming kind of a bottleneck, unfortunately, because we can only address so much feedback and, and improve it so fast. The second problem, that music listening data or playback data that we started gathering very strictly at the beginning, well, 
that's now even more important for the company, and it's, uh, it's, it's coupled to so many different parts of the organization. For example, we have a team in finance who's responsible for cleaning it, and then we have teams in personalization who are responsible for serving it to the broad company. I don't know how that organization ended up being the case, but we can see diverging priorities amongst the different teams which are responsible for parts of that data. For example, finance wants things to be stable. Change is scary to them. Personalization wants to experiment all the time. Uh, and these two things can diverge. Thirdly, we still have the problem where data is exploding, but insights are not. And we did improve it with Spotify session data, but that's only one domain of data. There's so many more areas and things that we should be able to conclude from the data that we're not able to do beyond just sessions. Now, to get a little bit theoretical and talk about the problem space that we see, it's in general important for a product manager to have in mind a vision and strategy for their problem space. And that's no different for a platform. Because a platform which is built and rolled out strategically can has, have serious ramifications for setting your organization up for success within that problem space. In my case, it's data. You can imagine with experiments or with deployments. Maybe deployments is a, is a great example because if you have a, a really robust CI CD platform which allows you to run a comprehensive suite of tests uh, and then you know that you're deploying safely, you can do that now dozens and dozens of times per day and be very agile. But the flip side of it is true too. If the tests take six hours to run and they're flaky, then you're going to end up not trusting your deployments and they become heavier and heavier and now you have an anti-pattern that you're trying to avoid. So a strategy should have three things. Firstly, it needs an understanding of the surrounding context, which I hope I've provided a little bit of now. And with that, it comes a diagnosis of the underlying problems. And I gave three examples earlier. Then it should have a set of guiding principles that you use to inform your decision making and the next step that you're going to take. With those, decision, with, with those guiding principles, then you craft a set of coherent actions, which will be the next steps that you believe you should take. And these next steps should be both providing immediate and iterative impact, but also be strategic in the sense that they open your, you up for future opportunity within that problem space. And none of that is specific to platforms. That's just product strategy 101. But what is specific to platforms is if the problem space is technical, then those guiding principles are going to be technical best practices. And those next steps are going to be various solutions which will pragmatically give you more and more impact. So the product strategy is not really representing something which product can, can come up with themselves. Product needs to collaborate with tech a lot to put together this product strategy because the product strategy is tech strategy. This is how we're trying to navigate the technical domain of data at Spotify. So I work together with the data experts and the tech experts, and we go and do some industry analysis. We talk to some of the companies that we consider to be peers of ours with, with respect to data, thing, uh, companies like Uber and Netflix and Twitter, and things start to point towards this really interesting paper from ThoughtWorks, uh, written by someone named Jean-Marc Degani. I hope I pronounced that right. And this, was a, this paper really resonated with me. I won't go into too much detail because it's, uh, it is detailed, but it's, it's very, very good. Um, do check it out. There'll be a link at the end if you're interested. Uh, but she calls out three common problems that scaling organizations have with their data architecture. Firstly, the centralized and monolithic problem. And Spotify has never been a centralized company. We had the autonomous squads. We've been very distributed. But as we stopped getting value, or autonomous teams stopped getting value out of their data, they, started, they stopped seeing it as a core part of their mission and became the owners of their data in name only, maybe. Uh, so I wouldn't say that we really have a centralized and monolithic data lake, but it's maybe an unowned and monolithic data lake. And that makes it easy to see why we're not getting the value out of it, because those data consumers don't have a producer on the other end which is listening to them. The second failure case that she calls out is what she calls the coupled pipeline decomposition problem. And this is what I see with our very, very important playback data, is that we have 
sort of broken down the problem space, but assigned different parts of the business to be responsible for mechanical functions. Like I mentioned that financial engineering is responsible for cleaning the data, and then personalization is responsible for making it available to the company. So I like this quote, that architectural decomposition is orthogonal to the axis of innovation. So the way that we're organized doesn't match what our priorities are and how we make change, which leads to coupling and slower delivery. Does that feel that? And then lastly, the siloed and hyper-specialized ownership problem. And she writes, quote, I personally don't envy the life of a data platform engineer. What we find are disconnected source teams, frustrated consumers fighting for a spot on the top of the data platform team's backlog, and an overstretched platform team. This is my team. This is describing the results of the thing I just talked about in the previous section. Put them together, and she writes, we have created an architecture and organizational structure that does not scale and does not deliver on the promise of creating a data-driven organization. Okay, so that's got me listening. It doesn't sound, all, doesn't sound so great when you read it that way and read this nice academic paper which describes all the problems you're having. But luckily, she proposes a nice paradigm for how we can try to be data-driven at scale. And it involves three kind of distinct paradigm shifts. The first one is the convergence of distributed domain-driven architecture with data. And the idea here is that data needs to be a critical interface into the various business domains that you have as a company. We knew this from the beginning. We knew that we needed a sort of data interface into playback because we had to understand and analyze the music people were listening to. But it, it's not, it shouldn't be limited to that business domain. It should apply to the others. And while this doesn't solve our data explosion problem, it does give us a framework for grouping the data and cataloging it and being able to create a uh, sort of a, a good, a good uh, holistic view of the data that we have and what we should be able to do with it. The second paradigm shift is the convergence of product thinking with data. And really what this is saying, or, or data as a product as we like to say, is to treat that interface as a product itself. And that means it needs to be staffed properly by a team which has the right data engineering capacity as well as a product manager. And within that team, uh, they will nat autonomously uh, navigate the problem space that they are supposed to operate. And then you have a product strategy for that problem space and all that good stuff. And I believe that by combining these two paradigm shifts, we can sort of tilt back that axis of innovation on the playback data and be able to, if we can organize all the different components within the same domain, then we won't have it being contrary to the organizational structure any longer. The third paradigm shift is the convergence of self-service platform design with data. And this is not a paradigm shift for us at all. We've always been in the business of having a self-service data platform. Arguably, we did it too well, which caused the data explosion. But what is a paradigm shift for us is combining all three of these together so that way we can break down the organization based on the business domains, build a set of data interfaces and data products which represent the really critical data use cases that we believe we should have access to, and, on top of, uh, and those will then sit on top of a set of platform products which will be supporting the various use cases nicely. And this is pretty theoretical. This is really representing the vision or the North Star of where we're trying to go. And that's the part of the, prod the, product spa the problem space that I find so interesting because all of the decisions that we're making are in the direction of this, even though we probably won't ever achieve a data mesh to the extent that we feel like we're done. But building a product is just trying to provide a solution to some of the existing problems that you have. The data collection problem that we ha product that we have is a solution to the problems we had yesterday. So I find that being called a product manager is kind of a bit of a misnomer because I'd rather be called a problem manager because what I do is I obsess in the problem space and trying to make sure that we're solving the right problems at the right time. And product strategy is not about having any particular product and getting more value out of that. It's about trying to move further and further through the problem space um, and 
and having more and more value. And in the case of platform products, because platform products are technical, if you recognize that the product is a solution, the platform product is a technical solution, and product managers don't come up with technical solution, engineers do. But together, between engineering and product management, we can come up with the right technical solution, which is going to have iterative value and be strategic, and working within the problem space of data, we can work towards making data collection at Spotify a solved problem. Some key takeaways that I would pass along from this journey of data at Spotify and platform product management in general. Firstly, the problem space for platform products is a moving target, and it changes as the organization gets more and more complex and their usage goes up. And a platform product can either strategically enforce standards within a scaling organization, but the flip side tr of that is true too, where you can solidify crippling anti-patterns if you're not strategic about it. And then you're kind of doomed to patching tech debt for a long time. And then thirdly, if the platform is supposed to solve an underlying technical problem or a technical problem space, the product strategy for that is tech strategy. And me as the, low, as the lowly PM am not the right person to come up with that myself. It needs to be collaborative across these two different domains. I've mentioned some different resources throughout this. I'm not sure if we're going to get access to the slides, maybe. Uh, yes, we try to. We will do that. OK. Yeah. Great. So here's some links to the various things I've referenced. Do check them out if you're interested. Um, if you found this interesting, I actually have a podcast that I host called Product Internals with another Spotifyer. Uh, it's around the topic of platform product management as well as aimed at uh, engineers or data scientists or other functions who have transitioned into product management. Do check it out. We'd love feedback on it if you enjoy it or otherwise. And lastly, if you really enjoyed this, we're hiring. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Robert, oh, this is really a complex problem you try to solve there, uh, I really have to say. And uh, what I think it's interesting that you call uh, your title the product manager the problem manager. I never thought about that, but uh, I think in this case, um, this is absolutely true. Um, so we have time for some questions. The microphone is here in the middle. Does someone want to ask Robert some things? So if not, we wait. Sometimes it takes some time that the questions come up. So um, I want to ask you about your team. Um, yep. So you now told, told your story, what you do exactly. So what kind of team is it? So how is it structured? How many people work together with you in this data platform team? Yeah, so the data platform team is actually made of four different teams. Uh, the team that I work with is primarily mobile engineers, which is building the tooling that send the data from clients to the back end, but we also have a team which is responsible for the underlying infrastructure, uh, and then there's another team which is responsible for um, uh, the GDPR framework, so the privacy regulations, and then uh, the fourth team is the data model. Uh -huh. Okay, so you said now um, th that you work with the app teams, the app developers, so uh, Spotify is mainly used on the mobile apps, of course, but mm -hmm. also on the desktop apps. Yep. Is there still uh, the web usage so high? Can you tell a little bit about the split there? Yeah, I, I don't know the split necessarily, but we, we think of web and, and JavaScript as one of the key languages that Spotify runs in. Uh, desktop itself has a, the, the front end is, is based in, I guess, TypeScript, I should say, uh, as well as all the different Ubiquiti devices are generally a uh, TypeScript SDK, both mm -hmm. to run playback, but also to collect data. So like the examples of that would be the speakers and uh, Chromecast apps and things like that. Mm -hmm, okay. So, are there some questions now? Did there come something up? Yeah, there is someone. Hi, I'm Marcelo. Um, Hello. I really enjoyed the talk because we do a lot of instrumentation in our company, so good to see where you are. You mentioned at the beginning that you were tracking UI impressions and UI interactions, mm -hmm. and you somehow evolved this concept. Are you still tracking this, but a better version, or did you go into a different paradigm? No, we're still we're still tracking them, but the <coughs> kind of magic is that we don't the feature teams don't need to uh, instrument those events themselves. The f opinionated framework basically generates those events on their behalf, so that way they are produced in a standardized way. But it's still impressions and interactions and page transitions. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, we would have some time for one last question. 
there is someone. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Um, first of all, uh, I really enjoy the Spotify recommendations from the last 10 years, and I really enjoy it for myself. And um, in the last months or so, uh, I frequently read about uh, Spotify should add a dislike button for the recommendation. For the recommendation. Uh, uh, what do you think about that or the, um, yeah, the actual product development with this? Yeah, I, I know this is something which is talked about internally a lot as well, uh, especially for uh, like the use case which comes up a lot is if you have kids that use your, uh, <laughs> that use your profile, then that could really ruin your recommendations. So I know we're talking about ways that you could exclude things from rec recommendations. Um, and in general, a dislike button would be a really important signal to capture and to train the models on. So uh, because I don't actually work with the recommendations, I, I just sort of support them to do what they think is best. I, it's hard for me to say, but uh, definitely it's something which is talked about. Okay, we are through the time, so we could ask a lot more questions. Robert, thank you very much for being with us, that you flew over from Stockholm. And you will be here for a while, so people can approach you. Yeah, I'll be here till the end of the day. That's cool. So, an applause for Robert Stevenson. Thank you. Thank you.